My early deliveries were often double bounces. Double bounces and full tosses. You name it. But I stuck at it. And I got pretty good at it. He's done it. Gary has absolutely no idea what has happened to it. Oh, and that's out. Caught behind. Yes, he's got it. First ball. Shane Warren. Yes! Oh, oh he's got it. He's got it. He's got it. It's a hat trick. Yes, he's got it. He's got it. It's a hat trick. That's a hat trick to Shane Warren. A great moment in his career. Got him. There it is. Wicket number 700. And they can't catch him. The passing of Shane Warren was a shock for many cricket fans. Not one, not two, but three former Australian cricketers who all feature in this video are no longer with us, which is sad considering I'm talking about events that only occurred in the late 2000s. As all three of them feature in this video, I just want to say that I have nothing but the deepest respect for not only Shane Warne, but also Andrew Simons and Philip Hughes. At the start of 2009, Australia were no longer the best test team in the world. The South Africans' 2-1 victory in Australia meant that they were now the holders of the ICC Test Mace. In just two years, there had been a lot of change to the Australian Test team as well. The team that had taken to the field for Warney's last test was now very different. Justin Langer and Matthew Hayden were both retired. So was Glenn McGrath and Adam Gilchrist. Brett Lee was injured and sadly wouldn't make it back to test level. Neither would Andrew Simons, who sadly began spiralling out of control into a dark place. Sadly, he was never the same cricketer again following the 2008 Sydney Test and the racism scandal surrounding it. As you look back on your cricket career, are you satisfied with it? Like, are you at peace? No is probably the answer to that. Um, as a player, I suppose, you want to go out under your own terms. I've noticed that, you know... We've had a lot of great players that have gone out of, out of Australian cricket the wrong way. Following the Test Series, South Africa backed up their domination by defeating Australia 4-1 in the ODI Series. However, Australia did unearth a podgy-faced 22-year-old debutante in front of 70,000 people at the MCG for the first 2020 International. Oh, where's that gone? That's over the fence! Down the fine leg. How did he get it down there? <laughs> oh, and now oh, the lineman on. Geez. That's massive. <laughs> what? That's 50 off 19 balls. Four sixes in that. What's this international cricket about? It's not that tough. Just rock up to 75,000 people at the MCG and start creaming them out the park. There's some catching practice for the crowd. Well played, David Warner. 52 off 19. Wow. Immediately following the dismal summer of cricket, Ricky Ponting had to lead his underdog team to South Africa for a three-test series against the new world champs. Victory in this series would ensure that the world number one mantle would return to Australia. The squad chosen for this tour included two spinners, Nathan Horitz, who was the current choice, and Bryce McGain was given another go after getting over his shoulder injury that had him sent home from India the year before. However, after the limited success they had already had with McGill, Hogg, Casson, White and Crazier, Australia opted to go into the first test without a frontline spinner. Good morning everybody, let's have a look at the Australian side that takes part in the first test match here at the Wanderers, Simon Kadic and Philip Hughes at the top of the order. Hughes, one of three men making their debuts in this Australian side. It is changing times in Australian cricket. The captain, Ricky Ponting at number three, Michael Hussey at four, Michael Clark is fit and fine and very eager to perform. Marcus North makes his debut from Western Australia. Brad Haddon, Andrew McDonald, Mitchell Johnson, Peter Siddle, Ben Hilfenhaus. That is the side, Hilfenhaus and North, the other two men making their debuts along with Philip Hughes. Australia a one-up. It didn't take long after tea. The resistance crumbled. Ricky Ponting and Australia are delighted. And why shouldn't they be? They are full value for their victory. As Mitchell Johnson finishes it off. And, Aus and Australia, underdogs coming here to South Africa, are making a mighty fine effort to retain the mace. It's all over. South Africa have been rolled over after tea. 
for 291, and this is how it ended. Australia won the first two test matches to reclaim the world number one position and take a 2 0 series lead. It was also the first time since Warren's retirement that Australia took an unchanged lineup into the second test, opting for no frontline spinner and using the very gentle off spin of Marcus North as a change up bowler. That, of course, all changed for the third test that took place in Cape Town. Um, <coughs> I don't know if we're leaning anyway right at the moment. There's been some serious discussion already the last couple of days, or last 24 hours especially, about about playing the um, the spinner out here in, in this venue. Uh, looking back through the, the records, spinners have done okay here. They've had to work pretty hard. They bowl lots of overs for their wickets here, which is pretty much the way right through, it, through South Africa anyway. Now you'd think that common sense would say to continue with Nathan Horitz, as he was the spin bowling applicant number six. Alas, this wasn't the decision made. Oh well, Ashwell, take a piece of that. Welcome to Test Cricket. I'm told that Bryce McGain is one of the nicest blokes in cricket and is very proud of the fact that he has been chosen to play a test for Australia. I just wonder though if his mum kept all the newspaper clippings from his one and only test match considering the headline following the first innings read, McGain bowling murdered in day two slaughter. Well, there we go. You might need one out there now. There he goes again. One more. Bryce toiled away, but after an innings of serving up his own brand of pies, his match figures read none for 149 of 18 overs. For those playing at home, that is a run rate of 8.27 runs per over. Just to rub salt into the wounds, it didn't get much better for poor old Bryce with the bat either. Brooks has got one. And he comes back for two. McGain's really got to go. McGain's run out by miles. But just look at this gather. The throw is not his best. But Dale Stain kept his eye on the ball, picked it up on the half volley. And completed the run out. So that's terrific stuff by Dalstein. And he has completed the debut from hell. McGain is only one year younger than Stuart McGill. And his one and only test came a few days before his 37th birthday. Meaning Bryce is one of the oldest debutants in test cricket. Better late than never I guess. The 2009 Ashes series in England was much anticipated as England was seeking revenge after their 5-0 annihilation two and a half years earlier. There was only one consistency shown by the Australian selectors with the decisions they made around spinners. And that was once that they dropped you for form, you were never ever seen in Australian colours again. This applied to every spinner between Warren and Lyon, except for one person, Nathan Horitz. Horitz was dropped and recalled, dropped and recalled multiple times throughout his career. The selectors treated him the same way I treat the Chase Australia. The only reason I'm watching it is because I'm waiting for the news to start. The selectors were pretty much the same. Horitz was being treated like a time filler, used to occupy a place until something better came along. Australia's squad for the five tests included Horitz as the sole spinning option. He was it. There was no one left else, apparently. In an unusual scheduling choice, the first test took place in Cardiff, Wales. Horitz was picked in the 11, and Australia dominated the test, scoring 674 for 7 declared in their first innings. Ponting, Cadditch, North and Haddon all made centuries. Going into the final day, England were 2 for 20 and still needed 230 runs just to make Australia bat again. Horitz and the other Australian bowlers had a great opportunity to give Australia a 1-0 lead. Or so we thought. Filthy delivery, smashed away by Anderson to huge cheers from this Welsh crowd. Well, Ponting has a lot of faith in this lad, Johnson. 
That was a terrible delivery. Oh, gone! Collingwood into the gully. It's a parried kite. Siddle takes the wicket for Australia. Collingwood stands absolutely motionless there. Australia turned the screw again. Collingwood's gone. Jimmy Anderson and Monty Panesar survived a pace barrage from Siddle and Hilfenhaus and absolute custard from an out-of-form Mitchell Johnson. Oh, oh, dabbed away England. Move into the lead of one. It's precarious. It's a jam shot down to third man from James Anderson. With just three overs to go and light fading, Australia turned to part-timer Marcus North, but it wasn't to be. The final English pair survived 11 overs and secured an unlikely draw for England. Handshakes. They've done it. They've worked it out. They've realised it. Monty Panasar and Jimmy Anderson, 10 and 11. Horrocks picked up six wickets for the match and impressed the king of spin himself. Look, I was impressed with Horitz. Mm. I know a lot of people were writing him off, but I'd seen him develop as a player. And I think as a player, if you improve as a cricketer, the more you play, it means you're learning. And I think that's mm. a good sign for someone like Nathan Horitz. And I thought for the matches he played, he bowled well. I thought mm. he actually bowled superb. So I wasn't surprised that he didn't bowl well because uh, I think I'd seen a fair bit of him and, and I've worked a bit with him. And I, you know, I, I was, I'm impressed with Nathan Horitz. Mm. Yeah! Hold him! Swan takes the final wicket, the Lord's voodoo comes to an end. First time since 1934, England beat Australia at Lord's. The second test at Lord's was an absolute debacle. England put on 196 for the opening wicket, and Mitchell Johnson lost complete confidence in his bowling, going for over six runs and over. Australia was set 522 to win, and were bowled out for 406. England 1-0 up. The third test was a dull draw thanks to the English weather, which meant that the Australians headed into the fourth test, needing a win to keep the series alive. Just like what had happened in South Africa, Horitz was dropped in favour for an all-out pace attack. On the very same ground where Shane Warne bowled the ball of a century to Mike Gatting, Australia romped to victory by an innings and 80 runs, which left them with the dilemma going into the final test at the Oval. It goes back to a conversation I had with Graham Smith in the World 2020. I said to him, how do you beat Australia? And he said, play them on flat pitches with not a lot of sideways movement. Because if you get them on a pitch that does a bit, that brings their four seamers into it. And that's what Ponting likes. As we've seen here at the Oval, he doesn't mm. like to go to his spinner. He mm. doesn't like captaining his spinner, but he loves captaining his faster men when there's something in it. There was a case, a game at Durban, when Siddle and the ball went through and seamed and swung, and Australia played really well. And I think that was reflected at Headingley, whereas at Lords, when it was a pretty flat pitch, mm. the Australian bowlers could not get anything out of it, and England with Flintoff got something out of it. In a way, the game proved a problem for Australia, though, because as, as NASA said, with the four seamers, they look mm. so good at Headingley, you can see why the Australian selectors didn't want to change the team. But that mm. old saying in sport, never change a, a winning team, is a dumb saying. Yeah, but that's if it was a yeah. normal over wicket, wasn't yeah. it? That's if a normal over wicket. You sure. get here and you look at that wicket and you go, wow, this is like a day three, day four pitch straight away. And if you're looking at the wicket and it's a horses mm. for courses, you know, I was standing next to Stuart Clark. And then he came up, I think I was with you, Nass, and I said, what do you think? He goes, what do you reckon? I said, mate, this is like day three or four. He said, yeah, I don't want to hear anymore. I want to play. And he walked off because he thought the spinner was going to play. So, mm. They're only one wicket away, regaining the ashes. The crowd at fever pitch. England won the final test comfortably and regained the ashes, as Ricky Ponting had to stand and watch the urn be presented to an English captain at the Oval for a second time. Following the disappointment of the ashes, Australia returned home for three tests against the West Indies, followed by three tests against Pakistan. For the first time since the retirement of Shane Warne, the same spin bowler played in all Australian test matches. On the same ground where Crazier had been dropped a year earlier, 
Nathan Horitz was taken apart by the Calypso King, Chris Gale, as he made a century of 72 balls. Oh, that's gone. That's a big six. Straight down the ground. Oh, it's on, on the roof. Down. Oh, he's in it uh, straight down the ground for six. And what a way to bring up a century. Chris Gale has played an absolute blinder. Magnificent six. Horrocks kept his spot, however, and grew in confidence. And after helping Australia to victory on Boxing Day against a competitive Pakistan, he turned his attention to the Sydney Test match. Australia had their backs to the wall going into the final day, with Pakistan well on top. Tense day for both sides. But I wouldn't uh, mind being in the Pakistan team today. They must be feeling pretty good about themselves. There it is, he'll get four. That's well played, Michael Hussey. Struck down the ground. He's 11th Test 100. First against Pakistan. Thanks to some Mike Hussey heroics, Australia set Pakistan 176 runs to win in the fourth innings. Could this finally be the moment where a spin bowler could spin Australia to victory on the final day of play at the SCG? There he goes. Yes. Got him! What a catch! That could win the match for Australia. Nathan Horace has taken a ripper. He went for the captain. He hit it as hard as a rocket. No, I think he's hurt. I think he's injured, but he's held on. What a catch. Even though there were some suspiciously unusual dropped catches and also the dismissals by the Pakistani batsmen were a little bit unorthodox. Nathan Horitz became the first Australian spinner to take five wickets on Australian soil since Shane Warne's Pfeiffer on Boxing Day when he got his 700th wicket. The last ball, the over. He goes again. Down the ground. Could be out. He should be out. He is out. What a victory for Australia. Horitz then travelled to New Zealand with the test team and helped them claim a 2-0 victory over the Kiwis. You'd think that'd be the end of the story, but it's not. Before you ask, I'm going to talk about version 1 of Steve Smith, not version 2. Version 2 Steve Smith is one of the world's greatest test batsmen who averages 60 runs per test innings. Version 1 Steve Smith was the blonde leggy who batted at 8 on debut for Australia. They're going to need some of this, the Australian Steve Smith on debut. He'll be enthusiastic. His turn will come with the ball any minute now. I just heard Shane Warne talking about Steve Smith, and here he is coming into the attack. Michael Clark has gone that route. He might have bowled another one from Sean Tate. He had one to bowl. Three overs, two for 11 from Tate. He needs to break this pair, the best pair, Cameron Akmal and Umar Akmal, the brothers with all the talent. Yeah! Oh, struck to him! Great captaincy, great bowling, and Australia back in it! That's all we're calling for. This could really set him up. Brave and courageous captaincy and courageous bowling too from Steve Smith. Steve Smith made his international debut at the start of 2010 in the T20 arena. He was heavily endorsed by the King of Spin as well, as he saw a lot of himself in the blonde leggy from New South Wales. Nathan Horrocks had done nothing wrong, nor did he deserve to get dropped. Not this time, anyway. But like I said, he was like the Chase Australia, and the selectors had found something else they'd rather watch. Smith was picked ahead of Horrocks for the first test against Pakistan at Lords in England after it was deemed too unsafe to play a test match in Pakistan. Smith debuted alongside Tim Payne. It's ironic that these two of future Australian captains debuted in the same test as they both would later lose the captaincy as the result of scandals. Dad, yeah. Gone straight to mid-wicket. Rushed on to him, gets his first test wicket, Steve Smith. Smith took three wickets on debut and became Australia's first choice spinner, I guess? He and Horitz would then travel from England to India for two test matches. But alas, there was no Crazier magic spells this time from either bowler, as India won the series 2-0. Horitz was dropped for the fifth and final time in his test career. 
Even more harsh, he was actually initially included in the extended 15-man squad for the upcoming Ashes, but was dumped when it was reduced just to 13 players. Although he didn't formally announce his retirement from the game, a newspaper reported weeks later that he was giving away some of his Australian cricket gear in a yard sale. Probably isn't a good sign. The King of Spin was not happy either, as he labelled the dumping of Horrits from the 2010 Ashes side as dumb. Believe me, this was by nowhere near the worst selection decision from that series either. Live around the nation, this is the X Factor. Look, I have to be honest, I'm a proud Tasmanian myself, and it was pretty cool to see three Tasmanians in Hilfenhaus, Ponting and Doherty all from the James Bogues end of the state, representing Australia at test level. Xavier Doherty was selected in an Ashes squad, looking to regain the urn after England were victorious in 2009. England hadn't won a series down under since 1986-87. Sadly though, that was all about to change. Here we go. Crowd cheers. Here's Siddle. Siddle's hat-trick was one of very few highlights for the Australians as Sir Alastair Cook dominated the series, scoring 766 runs at an average of 127. Doherty toiled away in Brisbane with little effect as England declared at 517 for one in their second innings. Ricky Bonding wins the toss. What's happening? Oh, we're going to have a bat, Mark. Beautiful conditions. Great day, yeah, it looks like a nice wicket. A um, little bit of grass on the top of it, might just swing around with a new ball for a little while. Should be decent pace with the grass on it, so uh, yeah, important that we obviously start the game very well. The selectors showed faith, however, and gave Doherty a go in the second test in Adelaide. Importantly, Australia won a crucial toss and elected to bat on a flat-looking high-scoring deck. A very good batting strip. Oh, a, shout. Oh, a bit of a mix-up. Can he hit him? Yeah. He can. Ponding's on strike. Here's Anderson. Oh, he's got him! He's got him at second slip. Boy, that's a good catch. Ponding's gone. First ball. Australia two for none. Edge straight to Graham Swan. Anderson started beautifully. Got the ball in the right end. Here he is. Mark's obliged with an edge to Swan. Underwhelming score, to say the least. Kevin Peterson teed off and sent Doherty into the stands on several occasions, along with his test career, which ended after two tests. He likes to do that. He likes to keep the scoring coming regularly. He likes to hit boundaries also. Now he uses his feet. He uses them beautifully. Oh, and puts him up on the hill. That's a big six. Xavier Doherty was given a second opportunity at test level three years later when he partnered Nathan Lyon in India for two tests. But his career ended at just four matches. After being demolished by an innings and 71 runs, Australia made wholesale changes to his test squad for the remaining test matches. Steve Smith came back in as spinner for the third test, which Australia won to level the series at one all and give the home side some hope. That should be it, and it is, there it is! Australia are back in the series! The campaign is on track! Unfortunately, that hope was all but obliterated at the MCG on Boxing Day. Yeah! Yeah! Oh, Matt Pryor has taken it. England have won the game. England have retained the Ashes. With the Ashes lost, and England sprinklering their way on a victory lap around the MCG, Australia was more thirsty than ever to find a bloke who could fill the much-missed place of Shane Warne. I firmly believe there are only two reasons why Michael Beer was chosen to play Test Cricket for Australia. 
Firstly, he was a newspaper headliner's dream. Secondly, Shane Warne liked him because his last name was Beer. Michael Beer had played a total of five first-class cricket games when he was called into the Ashes side. Ricky Ponting had never seen him bowl in a match until the fifth test in Sydney. As it turned out, Ricky Ponting missed the test due to an ongoing elbow injury, leaving Michael Clarke a stand-in skipper. Simon Cadditch was also dropped, which was probably a relief for Pup, as Cadditch had gotten him in a headlock at the same ground two years earlier. Usman Khawaja came into the side for his debut as a replacement for Ponting, and Beer came in as first choice spinner. This could well be out. It is. The umpires are just checking this. Oh, it is a no ball. It is a no ball as well. Oh, it's a great catch. Or at least Australia think it's a great catch. Beer toiled away and eventually, after two failed attempts, got Alastair Cook for his first wicket, right after Cook had scored his third century for the series. As for the test, England won their third game by an innings and Australia's spinning stocks had hit rock bottom. Hello everybody and welcome to the final of the KFC 2020 Big Bash. It is the South Australian Redbacks playing host to the New South Wales Blues. Before there were teams such as the Stars, Scorchers, Strikers, Hurricanes and Renegades, the KFC 2020 Big Bash competition was played amongst the state teams. In 2011, the South Australia Redbacks won their first title of any note since 1996. And in that team was a young cricketer, and former Adelaide Oval ground staff member who would go on to take more than 400 test wickets. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. This has been the key to his bowling and the success of his nine wickets so far in this competition. He's flighted the ball really well and got a bit of turn. Bowling, line! It went straight on! And they have struck in a big way, two wickets. Two for 42, New South Wales. Oh, this kid's got something. That's just gone straight on. Phil Jake's expecting it to turn. Nathan Lyon took two wickets in the Big Bash final and became the leading wicket taker for the tournament, which is pretty impressive considering he was playing grade cricket at the start of that summer. The Australian Test team flew out to Sri Lanka later that year, with Lyon being named as an absolute bolter in the 15-man squad. During a warm-up game, both Beer and Lyon bowled in tandem on spin-friendly pitches. Beer took more wickets. Lyon asked more questions. Then on the 31st of August 2011, after only playing six first-class matches, Nathan Lyon was selected over Michael Beer as Australian Test Player number 421. And yes, as we already know, he made an impact straight away. And uh, here he is now on a turning pitch. He's been given the ball. Uh, an off-spinner bowling to left-handers. Normally off-spinners like that. So uh, here we go. Oh, and he's got a wicked first ball. Yes, he's got a wicked first ball. What a, what a start to a career these two are having. First it was Copeland. Now it's Lyon. That was a lovely ball first up. A little bit of drift, a little bit of turn, a little bit of kick, and what's more, a really good catch. Oh, got him. Slow through the air. What a terrible shot, because uh, Matthews was looking to sweep that off the fall. But he missed it completely. Oh. A turn and an awful lot of bounce for Nathan Lyon. I'm delighted. Catch! Up in the air and taken easily. Johnson rushes in from deep square. Special already. He picked up a wicket off his first delivery and yet another. Ponting takes a very smart catch. Nathan Lyon can do no wrong today. Catch! Oh, it uh, bounces and turns and goes straight to ground. This is uh, only a question of time the way I see it. 
no man's land at the moment, halfway. In the air, oh, what a catch! What a magnificent catch! Well, that's five wickets as well. Lyon is having a wonderful time. He'd, he'd have to think that this Test match cricket was a, a bit of, well, a doddle. Wonderful catch, turned a bit, stopped a little bit. He went to his right, I didn't think he was gonna latch onto it. And uh, well, he did, and this is the reaction. After five for 34 on debut, Lyon became Australia's first choice spinner. The rest is history, so they say. But do you ever wonder what might have happened if Sangokara edged Lyon's first ball through the slips, narrowly missing Clark's hands and running away for four? Would he have gotten the Crazier treatment from the selectors? Or maybe the Bryce McGain treatment by the batsman? After all, Shane Warne went one for 150 in his first ever test. The difference was, back then, Australia was a domineering team, and they gave Warne a second chance. After Warne retired, the selectors were so desperate to replace Warne that they failed to realise that you just simply can't. He was a -a once-in-a-generation bowler, who we will never see the likes of again. As for Lyon, he is now the greatest off-spinner of all time, according to his stats. His selection ended a run of 10 spin bowlers used, some of which were born at the wrong time, some in the right place at the right time, and some who wish they could probably have their time over again. I hope you have enjoyed my revisit into the hectic four and a half years that was the long and desperate journey from king to goat. Thanks for watching.